All right, good morning, everyone. We're gonna begin. Uh, welcome to the 2021 Southwest Florida Climate Summit. This is the inaugural event. We're so pleased that all of you could join us today for this incredible jam-packed day full of informative presentations and interactive question and answer sessions with you, our audience. The once predicted climate changes are now occurring with the headlines in the Washington Post just yesterday reading, America's new normal, a degree hotter than two decades ago. Coming from the recently released NOAA report, where you can see on the graph on the left that Florida is one of the most affected states. These past couple of years, there's been more evidence of increased intensity of storms, sea level rise, and other climate impacts being felt across the globe. In fact, the 2020 Atlantic hurricane season had 30 named storms, the most storms on record, with six of those being major hurricanes like the Cat 4 Hurricane Laura pictured here. While the challenge is immense and the window of opportunity to curtail it is narrowing, we're seeing growing awareness and acceptance that is manifesting into bipartisan actions at all levels of government. At the federal level, in just the past few months, our president has pledged at the International 2021 Leaders Summit on Climate that the United States will reduce greenhouse gas emissions by half from the 2005 levels by the year 2030, as well as has issued an executive order to achieve net zero emissions by no later than 2050, and one that calls for increasing renewable energy on public lands and in offshore waters. There's also a new focus on bringing environmental justice to disadvantaged communities who have often been disproportionately impacted by climate change. On the state level, our governor and legislature has taken bold steps to establish the Resilient Florida program with $611 million of funding appropriated this year to implement projects to enhance community resiliency across our state. The governor has also created Florida's first chief resiliency officer position, whom we're fortunate enough to have personally with us today. On the regional level, there are multiple climate compacts amongst local governments that have formed, including one right here in Southwest Florida that we'll hear more about later today. We have a great lineup of panel presenters on the agenda, starting with Southwest Florida climate leadership to the state of climate change science, then on to the policy and legal framework for climate action, growing climate awareness, and actions to move resiliency forward in Southwest Florida. In lieu of our presenter introductions, we refer you to the presenter's biographies that are available on the CHNEP Climate Summit webpage to learn more about the impressive array of scientific, legal, and policy experts that we have presenting here today. The Coastal and Heartland National Estuary Partnership is pleased to host this event. We were formed in, by Congress in 1995 under the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and are a partnership of local, state, and federal entities working together with private organizations and nonprofits on natural resource management, our mission being uniting Central and Southwest Florida to protect water and wildlife. Our partnership includes 10 counties and spans over 5,000 square miles outlined here. We wanna recognize our event sponsors today, WGCU Public Media, Environmental Defense Fund, and the Florida Gulf Coast University Water School, and to have them provide some opening remarks as well, starting with Dr. Mike Savarese from FGCU. Good morning, everyone. Um, glad to know you're all here. It looks like we're gonna have a lot of attendees. I wish we could be doing this in one room, but I guess uh, it's just not practical. Um, I just wanted to, on behalf of the Water School at Florida Gulf Coast University, I wanna welcome you all. And um, I'm so enthused about the general interest throughout the region for this particular summit. I just wanted to let you know that the Water School is here as part of a part of your local university to help with all matters related to water. And of course, uh, climate directly uh, deals with water and associated problems with, with, uh, with water as we move forward into the future. And we look forward uh, to working with the community uh, now and as we move into the next few years. Thanks. And now we'll hear from Don Sheriffs of Environmental Defense Fund. Good morning, everybody. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Environmental Defense Fund, we've been around since 1916 looking for, or sorry, 1967, looking for practical and lasting solutions 
to the most critical environmental problems facing the planet. And just last year, we actually opened our Florida office. I'm really pleased as a Floridian to be joining all of you today and excited to, uh, to have this partnership with CHNEP. You know, Florida's got 1,400 miles of coastline, a one of a kind ecosystem, and booming population. Those things all make it especially vulnerable to climate change. We've got a lot of challenges ahead, so it's really important that all of you are here today. And we know that if we use best in class science, we can advance pragmatic solutions. So we are proud sponsors of the Southwest Florida Climate Summit. Looking forward to spending the day with all of you focused on solutions for our state. Thank you. Great, thank you so much to our event sponsors. Now we're going to introduce you to Minty, the web tool that we'll be using today to collect your questions and comments throughout today's event. If you would take out a smartphone or open another browser web page on your computer and enter menti.com. Once the page has opened, you'll enter a code and the code is 6828. 2394. You'll see that on the screen here. So I'll give you a moment to do that. And you can participate in this, whether you are a registrant through the Zoom webinar or you're viewing this live through the CHNEP YouTube channel. When you see the Minty page open, it's going to ask you a question. Feel free to enter your response which is then being live streamed onto the presentation screen with the other responses being received here. So this is just a quick question about who we have participating today. We had over 400 registrants. So we'd like to know who you are. And it looks right now for the moment that we have resource managers in the lead and scientists, but we also have a, quite a few nonprofits, concerned citizens, policymakers, and legal policy professionals. So we'll give you a minute more to practice with this because this is the method by which we'll be collecting your questions and comments throughout the day. All right. It looks like uh, we're still receiving responses and we'll give you another chance to practice this later on this morning. So just to go over our first session this morning and again, the agenda uh, the proceedings, uh, all the supporting documents around this summit are available at the chnep.org website under the Climate Summit page. Uh, but I'll just go over panel one here. The first session this morning is on Southwest Florida climate leadership. We're going to hear a personal video address from Senator Marco Rubio and from D Director Janine Gettle of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Region 4 Water Division for the summit participants, followed by live comments and question and answers from Chief Resiliency Officer and Secretary of Florida Department of Environmental Protection, Noah Valenstein. And so with that, let's begin. Good morning, this is Senator Marco Rubio, and it's an honor to represent this great state of Florida in the United States Senate. And first of all, I'd like to thank the Coastal and Heartland National Estuary Partnership and the sponsors of the Southwest Florida Climate Summit for the great work they do on behalf of our state, the Sunshine State. You know, as a Floridian, it's clear to me that a holistic approach to improving environmental quality and restoring debilitated ecosystems must be central to our efforts to improve our state's climate resilience. 
That's why securing funding and authorizations here in Congress for ecosystem restorations, including Everglades restoration, the National Estuary Program, and the NOAA Corals Program, have been priorities of mine in improving our ability to mitigate climate impacts. Everglades restoration is a great example of world-class ecosystem restoration that, that I've worked on and championed, and it's an effort that will help us to accomplish many of our climate preparedness goals. By improving water quality and restoring natural water quantities throughout the greater southern Florida ecosystem, Everglades restoration will recharge our wetlands and coastal mangrove habitats and nurture new generations of oyster beds and seagrasses, all of which serve to protect our coastal communities from storm surge and from coastal flooding. Everglades restoration will also secure our water resources as Florida's population continues to grow by recharging our aquifers to prevent saltwater inundation from spoiling our vital drinking water. Another ecosystem that is critical for our climate resilience are our coral reefs. The Florida Reef Tract is the third largest coral reef barrier in the world, and as a recent U.S. Geological Survey study confirms, the reef provides life-saving storm surge mitigation services to thousands of Floridians annually. But sadly, our coral reefs are in decline due to environmental stressors and stony coral tissue loss disease, which is rampaging throughout the Florida Reef Tract. That's why I've reintroduced the Restoring Resilient Reefs Act to reauthorize the Coral Reef Conservation Act for the first time since it expired back in 2004. The bill I've introduced would authorize much needed funding for coral reef restoration and would implement key reforms to empower state, local, and non-governmental partners to fund and implement innovative coral rearing and restoration techniques. These efforts are crucial for healing our corals which have been decimated in recent years. I've also pursued climate resilience by securing funding and, and authorization for comprehensive Army Corps of Engineers coastal and storm resilience studies to better prepare us for future impacts. Through the 2016 Water Resources Development Act, I champion the authorization of the South Atlantic Coastal Study, which will result in specific coastal resilience recommendations for the consideration of Congress, the state of Florida, and our municipalities. The study is ongoing, and the report to Congress is expected very soon. As a result of the lessons I've learned and the relationships I've formed in pursuit of these priorities, I've come to understand that finding solutions to our climate and environmental challenges doesn't have to be a partisan issue. Thankfully, many of my colleagues have also come to this conclusion. Last Congress, I joined the Bipartisan Senate Climate Solutions Caucus to help develop a consensus with my colleagues and to ensure that Florida's unique climate and environmental perspectives are properly represented. Our work through the caucus has allowed us to elevate the climate discourse above partisan talking points and is already allowing us to advance common sense proposals. And I look forward to continuing this important work in the 117th Congress. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak today and I hope to see you all in the near future. Good morning, I'm Janine Gavel, Director of the Water Division at EPA Region 4. I would like to thank the Coastal and Heartland National Estuary Partnership for hosting this climate summit and engaging stakeholders to address the significant challenge of climate change. I am sorry that I cannot participate in person today, but I am ably represented by other EPA participants. Administrator Regan has made addressing the climate crisis a priority for EPA. Climate stress is often experienced as water stress, drought, flooding, sea level rise, and the water sector is central to managing these events. This is why EPA will aim to make water programs part of the solution for the climate crisis. We will do this by communicating our adaptation and lessons learned at the watershed scale. Our efforts will focus on community partnerships, coastal efforts, and core Clean Water Act programs, such as the National Estuary Programs. As you all know, climate change is affecting us now. The increase in extreme weather events associated with climate change underscores the need for communities to build infrastructure and manage resources that can maintain performance when impacted by such disruptions. For this reason, EPA encourages communities to use an integrated planning process to provide solutions that are adaptable and resilient to climate change while addressing community needs. And the National Estuary Programs here in Region 4 have been answering this challenge with action. 
Region 4's NEPs have led the development of climate adaptation or resiliency plans for their study areas, states, and the region. The National Estuary Partnerships in Southwest Florida and throughout Region 4 have led several initiatives to address climate change. The NEPs have completed climate change vulnerability assessments to determine vulnerabilities and climate change impacts and then incorporated those into their updated comprehensive conservation and management plans. The NEPs in Region 4 have also led many projects under EPA's Climate Ready Estuaries Program, which works with NEPs to assess climate change vulnerabilities, develop and implement adaptation strategies, and educate stakeholders. All of this shows that the partners with EPA's National Estuary Program have provided leadership in developing community-based solutions to climate stress. And this is why EPA recognizes the NEPs as vital organizations in preparing for and mitigating the effects of climate change. It is also why we here at EPA look forward to continuing to work collaboratively with the National Estuary Programs and other partners to address climate change. And it is why I appreciate the opportunity to share these remarks and for EPA to participate in your summit. I hope that you have an excellent exchange of information and look forward to continuing to work with you and meeting with you in person in the near future. Thank you and have a great day. Great, we are honored to have those personal video addresses from EPA and from Senator Marco Rubio. Now we'll be turning to our live present presenter, Chief Resiliency Officer and Secretary of the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, Protection Noah Valenstein. Noah, I believe you're on the line. Good morning. Good morning, Good go right ahead. Good morning. Yeah, thank you. Good to see you and thank you for having the event and a very timely um, conversation about resilience um, after what was a very successful legislative session and really the culmination of years of work by organizations that are represented um, at this gathering, especially our estuary programs, um, uh, but the public servants involved, um, our nonprofits involved, all working to sort of help build upon the successes we've had in Florida. And then I know everyone has been working really hard over the last several years to take those successes and build an enduring framework here in Florida to make certain that we are a national leader on addressing sea level rise and resilience issues and other impacts from climate change and to do so in a way um, that's enduring and builds on our successes. And so I'd start with, and then we'll come back to this as, as the request, um, which is that those on the call stay involved over the next year because a lot is going to happen. And I think the input and involvement from each of you is going to be critical to getting the most out of that possible. And so I'll touch on a few things and go back to them. But I know many of you have already been involved in the uh, work that's being done on the slip analysis tool, which is that sea level rise impact analysis for publicly funded projects along our coastline. Um, and so there's work to be done on that. But we also want to make sure as we work on bringing that in for a landing that we um, have it reflect the new successes coming out of the legislature to make sure um, that's in the best spot possible. Obviously, the legislation, you know, I'll, I'll briefly talk about in a second creates a tiered planning process um, for us, both about collecting information, projects, and then implementation. Um, and that has to be data-driven. Um, obviously, that was the whole point of having a chief science officer and a chief resiliency officer uh, within the DeSantis administration. But it also has to be um, engageable uh, for the, the public. Right? It needs to be something that furthers uh, the sort of groundswell of support in addressing climate change. You know, we need to make sure that as we present data, take action on data, that we do it in both a transparent way, but an engageable way that continues to build 
the team here in Florida working on those issues. Um, and so I would start with that and, and, and sort of reflect on and talking about where we've gone this session, the successes we've already had in Florida due to um, local initiatives. Southeast Florida Clim Climate Compact obviously is held up around the world as an example of to how to have local governments address impacts from climate change um, and then take action on it in a open, transparent, collaborative governance structure. Um, I think the thing I'd like to, to mention and really harp on at the moment about the many successes uh, that that compact has had is the way they have treated data and the way they have um, displayed data. And so I think at the heart of some of the work the compact did was to make sure that they were both able to talk about sea level rise in raw terms of what has been measured at longstanding NOAA um, tide stations or tide gauges and say, hey, here's a, a baseline. They chose a five-year average for those. But then is also able to say, we have clear data. Here are all the data points to show an increasing trend. And here's how we um, think we should handle that data as far as which sea level rise curves we should use what time period they're appropriate for, but be able to present that all at once because so often I, th I think what's happened in conversations on um, various climate change impacts is you may have a stakeholder who hasn't been as involved in the conversation and they may not latch onto or trust one particular projection and it skipped past the point that no, there are concrete data points leading into this model, right? This model is based on measured in fact, and then um, the predictions are based on data points that we can actually talk about display that lead into that model. And I, I think it really behooves us all to make sure that we have those conversations in a transparent fashion. Um, and I think the Southeast Florida Climate Compact um, in there, their unified sea level rise projections has done really a fabulous job at, at, at that. And so I mentioned all that to say is as we were moving forward with um, last year's legislation that required us to um, create a analysis tool for projects in the coastal construction area that were receiving state funds to have those projects go through a public analysis on what the impacts of sea level rise and flooding is going to be to those projects in the future. We also wanted to be able to, while not directly required by the SLIP tool, we wanted to be able to, as an agency, stand up and do that same thing that um, compacts and communities have already done, which is come up with a recommendation as far as what uh, sea level rise uh, curve should we be using or combinations of curves and how should we be um, utilizing a unified sea level rise projection and putting it out in terms that's easy to understand so that there's consistency among state agencies, a clear message, and importantly, if you're a community who hasn't yet um, worked on a vulnerability analysis, you know, we're at a little over, I think, 50% or right around 50% right now that have done vulnerability analyses or peril of flood, um, many of those who've received grants from DEP. Um, but that if you're not, that you're not starting from zero, that you can actually look to the state and say, all right, the state's created a template for us. They have a clear recommendation. That makes it easier for the local government to move forward. Um, and, and so we were excited about those two things and thought that was tremendous progress in itself. Um, you know, that's all aiming to be landed this, this summer. Um, and then of course, uh, this session occurred uh, with now um, more than $500 million uh, in funds put towards resilience. Um, so an order of magnitude increase than what we've been used to seeing. I really appreciate the governor's leadership early on calling for a billion dollars in funding. Um, and, and I think with that support, certainly the speaker and the Senate president's support, uh, there's really been a, a change in um, how aggressively we're gonna be able to handle 
um, planning and also um, adaptation to sea level rise. And that process starts with creating new data points. Um, and so there's a request for more granular information on both the geographic distribution of sea level rise and also temporal variations to make sure um, you know, we can communicate very clearly where the data is coming from and what communities should be planning for and what period of time. Um, there's also $100 million provided for coastal mapping, um, which provide even more data set. The next stage after that was um, creating a statewide plan, um, which is something that we've talked about for a while, slip analysis, as well as our unified sea level rise projection recommendation would create the basis for that. But now this would have us doing that um, in year two, um, once we've collected additional data and then wrapping it all together in year three with that and a, a project list um, together. And so we think that's gonna create an enduring framework here in Florida. Um, obviously it also has us bringing forward project lists based on the planning that's already been done um, already for next year um, and current year. And so that is an exciting time to live in. Um, I think the, the to, to circle back as far as um, the importance of what this team can do over that next year, again, is staying involved to make sure that as we launch that slip analysis tool and as we launch um, the, the first round of, of this new legislation for really doing that intense data analysis that we get as far down the road as possible, that we learn from the wins of local governments and other states. Um, and that in year three, we clearly are the, the leader in the US for planning for sea level rise and resilience. And I'd end with, although we've talked a lot about sea level rise, resilience planning, um, certainly I'd urge us also to see the connections between the work we do in resilience is a little bit of everything we do as a state, right? As we work on water quality, as we work on land acquisition, as we work on any of our regulatory uh, programs, resilience and understanding how climate change and changes to um, either sea level rise, flooding, inland flooding is going to overlay all those programs is a critical aspect too. And so that's, you know, I hope everyone here carries the banner in the conversation that you're having, no matter what it is, to remind folks, hey, there is some overlay of sea level rise or climate change analysis to the conversation. So with that, um, I'd hand it back over to you, Jennifer. Great, thank you so much, Secretary. I hope you are able to just stick around just for a couple minutes to answer a few questions. Uh, for those of you online, um, you're gonna wanna go to Menti. Uh, looks like we already have some questions coming in. So feel free to answer those um, as you wish. Secretary, thank you. Sure, sorry for my backlighting, obviously. And then also the fact that I'm not wearing glasses. So I'll give it my um, best go. So I think the first one that I will try to read was essentially, how can we protect private coastal properties from the impacts of sea level rise while preserving critical habitat for sea turtles, shorebirds, um, and other species that depend on sandy beaches for survival? Um, I think we've got to, you know, the reason the legislature started with data collection and also sort of analytical tools is to create the conversation of, we have building regulations, um, obviously number of regulations regarding impacts to surface waters that could create more flooding. We certainly have coastal construction regulations. The question is, are those regulations getting fed with the data that allows them to see the impacts, not just of what's here or what was here 10 years ago or five years ago, but what's the current um, state of the environment and what is the state of the environment going to be 10 years from now in that location, right? Are, are we actually, is the, is the correct data being fed into those re regulatory programs? I think is one, right, is to make sure that we have um, 
data sets that allow those robust regulatory programs to actually correctly analyze what that um, environment is going to look like um, currently and into the future. And then the second thing is, and kudos, I, I brag on Sarasota all the time, but I know um, other communities are doing just a tremendous job too. How we utilize green infrastructure and environmental projects, I think is probably a under talked about and under recognized um, area that we need to be concentrating all as environmental professionals. Um, having um, coastal projects uh, or even stormwater projects that create um, intentional flood inundation areas along the coast that utilize green infrastructure that actually have folks support them because they are becoming part of the park system that they make the community more vibrant and beautiful, um, I think is going to be key to being an area in Florida that as we address um, sea level rise that again, we're still able to enjoy sandy beaches, green spaces. Um, I think the constant fear that we hear is, you know, we don't want Florida to become one long seawall. Uh, and I think that is the consensus for everyone you know, and creativity um, on how we utilize green infrastructure is going to be key there um, and, and something that we really need to focus on. And that actually was discussed a fair amount this legislative session. Um, so I'm looking at does climate change acknowledge and include sea level rise, which is already occurring along the Florida East Coast and detrimentally affects the affected cities? Does it include water quality that has affected the Southwest Florida area? Thank you. Um, yeah, and I, but I think the, so you've had water management districts each including their water supply plans impacts from climate change, that's changes in rainfall patterns, inland flooding patterns, um, saltwater intrusion from sea level rise. Um, I, I, I think where we stand as a state though is how do we best aggregate all that, right? The fact is that that was, that information that I just meant as far as water supply and saltwater intrusion and that analysis is included in a document that's a water supply plan, not a climate change plan or sea level rise plan. And I think that's the change that we're in the midst of right now is to say, this is an important enough issue that while there's been good work done, it's been incremental in various buckets, let's make sure that we're taking it head on and having those individual conversations all in one spot um, to make sure we're making as much progress on it as possible. Uh, I see another just going down below that. Can we restructure the regulatory process to help incentivize green infrastructure? Absolutely, would love ideas. Um, you know, we've had that for permitting discussions internally in a work group internally, um, specifically um, on on either mangrove plantings, you know, green shorelines, but. As I mentioned, I think that's an area that we're going to have to concentrate more on more, more and more. And you're right, we started that internal working group um, because we heard comments that it was easier to permit a known commodity like a seawall than something creative like mangrove planters, um, living shoreline. And that can't be and should not be the, the case. And the department's committed to making sure we do that. I think we've got a, a little way to go, um, but also think that right now, what is green infrastructure and the project opportunities and the creativity that we see out there right now for combining again the sarasota in their bayfront project combining public parks with flood inundation zones stormwater treatment mangrove plantings we're seeing creativity in from local governments that is you know allowing new projects that haven't been seen except for in the last five years. And we need to be able to, as a state, take those ideas and make them easier to replicate. And so if you've seen projects that you think are successful and you believe need to be easier to be replicated within the state, um, certainly we as an agency want to hear that and make sure that's the case. 
let's see, what mechanism is in place for adjustment of projections in a timely fashion as conditions of change in order to have meaningful resilience projects and then get it adjust to year three projects? Um, so I think that's, again, one of the reasons why the legislation came out with starting with increased data sets. Um, it also requires the plan to be regularly updated. And so I think those are sort of the two direct answers to that um, is that it shouldn't be a one and done. Um, but then lastly, I think that comes with well done sea level rise projection tools. Again, so like the unified sea level rise um, documents for um, the Southeast Florida Climate Compact. No one's no one says here's the one sea level rise um, curve you should use. That's it, right? It's about having a matrix of what have we actually measured, what's the the measurement we've seen to date in this area, and then moving forward, what type of project are you talking about? What's the built life of it? Um, how long is it planning to last? Where is it? And then here are the recommended curves, but also when you should use those and why. Um, and it needs to be that sort of robust dialogue. And I think that helps get at making sure that you have projects that you don't go through an analysis and feel like three years down the road that that analysis wasn't robust enough or didn't ask you the critical enough questions to help you make those decisions. Because again, there's never going to be a perfect right or wrong decision. There's going to be a risk management decision and did you make that risk management decision um, in a structured, thoughtful way? And clearly we need to maybe do more public workshops on um, making permitting easier for restoration enhancement projects because they've seen, now seen that um, question in a few spots. Um, So I, I, I will probably literally not quite answer the what is Florida's upper limit of sea level rise. In other words, you know, how high will sea level rise before the economy collapses? Um, I, to me, the most important question to answer right now and what I've, I've repeatedly said is the first impact from sea level rise as a impact from climate change to Florida, you know, I think most folks point to either saltwater intrusion um, or some of the coastal flooding we see. I, to me, it's before either of those, it's been um, economic, right? It's the economic cloud of, should we continue to come to Florida as a business and invest in Florida? Should we relocate our company headquarters here? Um, should we bring our real estate project to Florida? Should we continue to invest in um, communities in Florida. And I think the number one thing that we as a state and as partners have to do is demonstrate that we've got sound planning in place for that and that we're taking the issue seriously. Um, and I think the last four years have really helped with that. I think this session hopefully puts the nail in that coffin and demonstrates that Florida is absolutely taking this issue head on, that we're having transparent planning for it, um, and that we're willing to put um, money, you know, to not just plan, right, but to get the whole state into a similar situation where all our coastal communities, communities have uh, vulnerability plans, we've got a statewide plan, but that we're not just planning, that we've also already started putting money into um, projects as part of that. And to me, that really situates ourselves um, in a good spot of being able to say, yes, we are taking this seriously. It's being done in a transparent fashion. We are willing to put the money into it. Um, and I think that is the most important thing to ensure that Florida's economy continues to thrive. Um, you know, with that, Jennifer, thank you for the invite. Um, happy to maybe circle back and answer more questions and put on my glasses so that I could have read more than just in the straight line down the middle. Um, and thank you for everything y'all are doing. Well, thank you, Secretary. So glad you were able to be here in person with us today and that you're at the helm of these resiliency efforts as our Chief Resiliency Officer. Very much appreciate your leadership. 
Nope. Thank you. And y'all's leadership too. And I'll give a shout out to Whitney Gray who does just a tremendous job for us and all our staff at DEP. Um, you know, we're blessed to have folks who could work anywhere, but work at the department because they love the environment and they're dedicated to public service. Um, and so for Whitney and everyone else within DEP, you know, thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you.